Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, the second of two webinars on neurodiversity in childhood brought to you by the Capital Health Network and neurodiversity experts in the ACT. Tonight's webinar focuses on childhood ADHD and the first webinar on childhood autism is now available on the Capital Health Network uh, YouTube website. First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on. I acknowledge and respect their enduring culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and welcome any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's event. Their land was and has never been ceded. I'm Dr. Leonie Harcourt, a GP advisor at the Capital Health Network. Also with me tonight are Kanal Mohiti from the Events Lead at Capital Health Network and ADHD specialists, paediatrician Dr. Joanne Edwards, psychologist Carla Crossman and acting chief pharmacist at ACT Health, Amanda Galbraith. So um, on to housekeeping. All participants have been muted. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. We're going to have a question and answer section, session at the end of all three presentations. So as you go, type your questions into the Q&A section on the Zoom screen, not the chat box, and we'll go through the questions at the end of the presentation, but type them in as they come to you during the presentation. Um, we're going to put the presentation itself up on the Capital Health Network YouTube page as well. So if you'd like to look at it again or share it with your networks, it's there um, for public review. Uh, CPD points, um, we'll send you out a certificate of attendance and you can upload uh, one and a half to two hours of educational activities to your CPD home. We'll also send out an evaluation survey at the end of the presentations and we really encourage you to fill in the surveys because they help us to work out the um, future topics so they meet your learning needs. Uh, so on to our presenters. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Joanne Edwards. Joanne is a general paediatrician with a special interest in mental health and neurodiversity. Joanne completed medical studies at the University of Queensland and paediatric training at the Martyrs Children's Hospital, Canberra Hospital, and then a fellowship in the Community and Child Health at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. She has completed a master's degree in both public health and psychiatry from the University of Melbourne, and she works private in private practice at the Calvary Clinic. So thank you very much. And over to you, Joanne. Um, can you hear me, Leonie? Yep. Yep. That's and good. Yeah. And we I'll can just, see you too. Great. Oh, great. I just, um, I, I'm just working out how to share my screen again. Sorry. Okay. Canal. That's, that's, we haven't got a screen yet. No. Yeah. Just a moment. Let me check. I just um it should be at the bottom of the screen. There's a green uh rectangle and it says share screen at the very bottom of the zoom screen. Yep, yep. yep. No, I've got it. I've got it. Yep. Um, sorry. Did that um has that come up as not yet. We can, um, if it doesn't work, we can share our version if you like. I've got, um, I think I've just popped on. This should be out. Is that, um, no, are we, are we going to the share, share screen option at the bottom, the green button? Sorry about this. That's all right. Wait, can I see my There we go. Yeah. It's come up. Uh and the so the presentation is up? Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Just need to be full screen, please. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Leonie, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for everyone attending. It's a great delight to talk about ADHD. And I'm very happy that um, Carla and Amanda uh, agreed to join us to make this talk a bit richer 
in terms of having a psychological perspective and also being able to talk with Amanda about stimulant prescribing in the ACT at the moment. Um, just in terms of broad concepts and to remind everybody that the term ADHD is probably not a fantastic term to describe what is a, a disorder of executive function and self-management. Um, as, as part of our, uh, in terms of an outline for this evening's talk, I thought we'd discuss concepts of ADHD and move on to diagnosis. And um, Carla Crossman, our psychologist, is going to help us um, talk about um, the process of diagnosis and how important um, that is. Uh, then I thought we'd talk at, at, with more detail about co-occurring conditions because these tend to be the rule rather than the exception um, before we finish up by talking about interventions and specifically around um, some medication issues. And Amanda will help us understand um, more about stimulant prescribing in the ACT. Um, the term ADHD, Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder, I think describes what some teachers might see in young children. And there are better terms to describe the cognitive, how that reflects a cognitive style. Um, and I think one of the more uh, widely used um, uh, concepts would be something more like variable attention and intolerance of boredom. Um, those diagnosed with ADHD tend to be more reflexive, instinctive, uh, impulsive, and this can create difficulties with emotional regulation and social engagement. Uh, there's a thought around the reward systems in the brain and how short-term gratification and the balance with long-term gratification tends to be at the short-term end for those diagnosed with ADHD, and that there's a strong urge um, to escape boredom and that topics particularly, um, um, and this is particularly relevant, obviously, for children at school, tasks tend to be, um, many tasks tend to be boring unless they happen to be of specific interest. Um, the executive function difficulties, which I'll describe in the next couple of slides, um, um, I think of this uh, concept like the conductor of the orchestra is not performing very well, but the orchestra itself in its individual um, part is, is, ha has no difficulty, uh, but tends to be doing their own thing. Um, another concept which has been quite helpful to understand um, an ADHD-affected brain is that there's difficulty filtering foreground and background information. So everything in the in a in a given time has the same um, relevance and importance. Um, ADHD is strongly genetic, with research suggesting that up to fifty percent of children with ADHD have parents that have similar features. Um, this slide probably describes all of the marvellous and all the marvellous um, um, characteristics and challenges presented um, um, by people with who've been diagnosed with ADHD. It, and an example that I had with my the last little person I saw this afternoon um, who started talking about gender differences in terms of um, his friends with neurodiversity and ended up discussing geopolitics and the problems in the in southern Africa. And it was just a really good and, and a good example of how rich um, and creative his brain was, but how difficult it was to kind of follow a sustained um, um, uh, pathway. A sustained story, 
and obviously this is much more difficult in the school setting. Um, Thomas Brown has proposed a theory of executive dysfunction in ADHD across six domains um, and has identified that those brains affected by ADHD may have more trouble with procrastination and difficulty problem solving because it's difficult to get activated if you're not interested in topics. Um, focus can be affected and this results in distractibility, being sidetracked and conversely being hyper-focused in other areas. Um, the alert, um, the alert system can be affected affected, leading to um, drowsiness and slow processing time. Um, emotional regulation is part of executive function. Um, memory, particularly working memory, is often affected. And action, particularly um, action without thought, um, which results, which can result in impulse um, control issues. Um, Russell Barkley, who's been writing around ADHD since the 1970s and 80s, when it was first becoming a concept, um, talks about um, the difficulties that some people with ADHD have around self-regulation um, and describes self-regulation as difficulties with self-awareness, inhibition, visual imagery, um, the ability to kind of reflect on the mind's eye, internal speech, emotional control, self-motivation and planning and problem solving. There's active interest and research around the brain circuitry involved with ADHD. Um, previously, it was thought to be prefrontal cortex dysfunction. And as we understand more about reward circuits and motivation circuits, um, it's, it's becoming a more complex picture. Um, the, the history of... ADHD in terms of medical um, literature really starts in the 20th century, but there were early descriptions of people, not, not just children with ADHD, um, in um, texts documenting uh, and describing um, early mental health um, issues. Uh, and these two texts from the 18th century uh, describe people that we would certainly classify as having um, ADHD characteristics today um, as part of mental dysfunction. Um, this quite popular book that was published in 1857 by a German um, physician and author um, has a whole poem about a child called Fidgety Phil, um, including these lovely... Uh, drawings um, he, describing this child's inability to engage with some family activities like the evening meal and this in my experience is a is a very characteristic feature of children with ADHD that that particular activity is quite challenging um, and there's a whole poem dedicated to this child uh, in terms of the 20th century, early in the 20th century, George Frederick Still, um, uh, in a series of lectures which were published in The Lancet, um, an English physician who's thought to be the father of paediatrics um, in England, uh, described 43 children, which we would now think of as having ADHD, um, with significant difficulties with a sustained attention, self-regulation, aggression, defiance, resistance, um, emotional dysregulation and difficulty with inhibition, but interestingly with a normal intellect. And that thinking progressed to various other descriptions um, prior to the ADHD language, um, which became more biological uh, after the uh, influenza uh, epidemic, the early influenza epidemic, epidemic in 1918 to 19, um, there, was a, there was a set of behaviours that were thought to be post-viral uh, that were very consistent with what we would now describe as ADHD. And people from that experience 
um, extrapolated out that children affected by this set of um, characteristics probably had um, brain da damage of some kind, sometimes obvious and sometimes not obvious. Um, and so in the 1950s, the term minimal brain damage and minimal brain dysfunction um, came to be used to describe that group of um, young people. Um, the term hyperkinetic disease of infancy was used from the 1930s, and that's um, uh, useful to understand because as the DSM evolved, the first um, in 1968, the the term used to describe this group of kids was the was children affected by the hyperkinetic uh, uh, sorry a hyperkinetic reaction. In DSM-3, uh, published in 1980, um, ADD was used, so attention deficit disorder was used with the, um, uh, with the specifiers with and without hyperactivity. By DSM-3R in 1987, the term used was ADHD, and although ADD is still in common um, parlance, it hasn't actually been part of the DSM since um, uh, DSM-3. Um, by DSM-4 in 1994, ADHD was divided into um, primarily an attentive um, or hyperactive or the combined type. And by DSM-5, that um, separation continued. But interestingly, ADHD could be diagnosed separately from autism as a comorbid condition because previously it couldn't be. Um, so I think diagnostically it was complex um, because there's so much overlap between those disorders that a child would received one of those diagnoses only um, prior to the um, DSM-5. In terms of prevalence shifts, I probably don't need to tell anyone that the prevalence, the um, prevalence of DHD is significantly increasing with time. This is CDC data from the US, uh, which is the most up to date kind of um, data we've got, um, which suggests that across a number of types of uh, reporting, uh, that there is around um, between 10 and 12% of people um, uh, these are four to 17 year olds across um, various studies could be diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and in Australia, the most recent um, prevalence data is from the um, reporting from AIHW from 2013 to 2014. Uh, and this is all children aged four to 11. Um, and the most common um, boys are in the um, dark teal, girls are in light blue, and all children are in the orange bars. And even back in 2013, 8% of children at that age could be diagnosed with ADHD. And this is not to suggest that, that happens, but um, this is what this prevalence data shows. Um, I will skip through some slides. The, this is UK data, um, which is more recent than the Australian published data. Um, showing males on the left and females on the right, and children um, on the top in the top two graphs and the adults in the bottom two graphs, um, showing significant um, uh, diagnostic shifts over time between 2000 and 2018, and um, certainly both across the children's uh, both sexes and adults has been a significant shift. And in fact, um, the, the most commonly diagnosed age group in America at the moment is, um, um, sorry, the average age of diagnosis in America in the US at the moment is 31. Um, so it is becoming much more of an adult diagnosis, whereas previously um, uh, data suggests that it was more commonly diagnosed in children. Um, this is an interesting table that's worth having a look at. 
it was um, part of the recent Senate inquiry into ADHD published in the Sydney Morning Herald in October, just demonstrating that between 2018 and 2022, ADHD medicines in Australia, including stimulants and non-stimulants, the government expenditure increased from 59 million to 151 million, and prescriptions increased over that time from 1.36 million to 3.17 million. Um, When I was training, um, so about 12 years ago, uh, when I was in Melbourne, the general thought at that time was that of children diagnosed with ADHD, 75% of people would grow out of their diagnosis as they approach their adult years. Um, the most interesting, th this um, 2023-21 study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. The most interesting line here is this green line at base, and, and this represents years from a diagnosis of ADHD and suggests that less than 10% of people at 16 years have fully recovered from ADHD, although there is some partial remission in larger numbers. Um, diagnostic stability over time across the three groups. And just to remind you, that's the predominantly inattentive type of ADHD, the predominantly hyperactive impulsive and the combined type. Um, this study uh, published in 2005 suggests that the combined type is probably the most stable um, and the predominantly hyperactive impulsive subtype tends to be re-diagnosed probably as the combined type um, uh, over time. And certainly uh, research suggests that over a lifetime trajectory, hyperactive impulsive tendencies tend to improve. Um, and the 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 inattentive um, set of symptoms tend to um, persevere. Um, in terms of diagnosing ADHD, I am going to hand over to Carla in a minute. But just as a as an introduction, firstly, in two thousand and twenty two, an Australian organisation produced a set of clinical practice guidelines for ADHD management, including some pretty um, um, useful advice around assessments uh, and a summary of what they've said about assessments uh, in, in, in this document, which is available in full at the website at the bottom of the page, uh, that an assessment for a diagnosis of ADHD should include the following, a full clinical and psychosocial assessment, including a discussion about a person's symptoms and strengths and how these present in different domains and settings of a person's everyday life, a full developmental mental health and medical history, observer reports and assessments of the person's symptoms and mental state, and a medical assessment to exclude other causes of the symptoms and identify any associated disorders that also require investigation, intervention and support. Medical investigation should only be performed if clinically indicated. The DSM-5 um, uh, criteria uh, have some number criteria for dividing up into the predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, or the combined type. Um, certainly my experience is the combined type is the most common. The inattentive criteria are uh, related to failing to give close attention to details or careless errors, um, difficulty to sustain attention, not seeming to listen, fails to follow through, fails to... Uh, has difficulty organising tasks and activities, often avoids dislikes, tasks which require sustained attention, losing things necessary for tasks. Um, a lot of children with ADHD are very well known to the lost property offices around the place. Um, children, inattentive children are easily distracted and forgetful. The hyperactive impulsive criteria are about fidgeting, squirming, leaving your seat, running around in, in difficult situations, 
unable to take part in um, leisure activities quietly, often on the go, um, as if driven by a motor, often talking excessively, blurting out things, interrupting, trouble waiting their turns. Um, and one of the other changes from DSM-4 to DSM-5 was that these symptoms should be present before the age of 12, whereas previously it was before the age of seven, and that symptoms should occur across two formal settings, and that there's clear evidence of functional impairment related to those um, set of symptoms, and that they're not better explained by additional issues. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Carla. I'm going to stop staring at my screen. Um. Thank you, Joe. That's great. Um, I'll just introduce Carla. So our second speaker tonight is Carla Crossman. Carla is an educational and developmental psychologist and runs Spark for Life Psychology Clinic for Children. Carla has extensive experience working with young people and she's passionate about helping young people increase their well-being and resilience and believes in using a strengths-based approach to help people find their spark. She aims to inspire change in their lives while also teaching them skills and strategies to help tackle life's challenges. So over to you, Carla. Thank you very much. No worries. Hi. Have you guys got me? Okay. Um, let me share my screen. All right. Can you see that presentation? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, see. perfect. Yep. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about, um, as a psychologist, the um, ADHD assessment process and I guess what, um, why to refer to a psychologist and what we actually do. Um, so I guess my first thing that I'm really passionate about is that we shouldn't assess individuals linear linearly. And what I mean by that is, we shouldn't be assessing does this person have ADHD or does this person have autism or does this person have a learning difficulty because, as this diagram shows, there's so much overlap between um, comorbid diagnoses and differences um, so that at our clinic we've actually stopped offering uh, ADHD or autism assessments. We provide comprehensive assessments. And so that means we screen for the whole range of things and look at the individual as a whole in order to look at what difficulties they're, they're experiencing and what explains their difficulties the best rather than a yes or no um, answer. And this is my favourite Venn diagram. We actually use Venn diagrams here in um, our differential diagnosis. We draw them up on our whiteboard tables and map out clients' um, difficulties into the different um, parts of a Venn diagram to see if we've got it right. Because as you can see, there's so much overlap um, and as Joe mentioned before, the comorbidities with ADHD is quite high. Um, I believe the rate of autistic individuals with ADHDs is um, up as high as 80%, um, but ADHD people with autism is lower as far as I'm aware. But yes, there's a lot of overlap. So it's really important to tease this out. And so to me, if we're looking at someone who has all these signs of ADHD, um, but they're all sitting inside an autism bubble and not really anything out here uniquely ADHD. While they have a lot of criteria and can technically meet the criteria for ADHD, like they may have, you know, more than six symptoms in each area, if they're all coming under the autism bubble, we're thinking autism probably better explains it. So this is my number one um, crucial point, I think, with assessment is to look at the whole picture. So... Um, some of this I know Joe's covered, but this is what the ADPA research um, and some other things out of the UK and things say. So all the guidelines are saying that the most important stuff in assessment is multiple informants and in-depth good clinical interviews and that neuropsych testing isn't actually mandatory. We don't need to do cognitive assessments or um, what are they called, the um, attention um tests that exist so all the research shows that when you do these um, additional stuff like direct observations of the child in class these computerized assessments all that stuff doesn't actually increase the um, accuracy of diagnosis and anecdotally I would agree with that we used to do direct observations and now only do them in very specific cases when warranted because it doesn't actually add um, to the validity of the accuracy of a, a diagnosis 
Um, so psychometric evaluation can be um, helpful in identifying co-occurring conditions. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit later in our assessment process. Um, the interview is the most important thing, and this is where lots of training comes in. So um, I don't know if you guys know about the DIVA. So the DIVA is an interview based on DSM-5 criteria for ADHD that comes out of the UK, and it's almost free. It's I think it's 10 euros to access indefinitely, um, and it's fantastic. It goes through all of the criteria in a very in-depth way, and we use that along with other um, interview stuff. Um, oops, standardised scales. Obviously, you all know about the Connors or the Vanderbilt and all those scales. They're definitely um, helpful and especially good at getting information from teachers and parents as other um, information providers. Um, again, the education information is really important. So getting school reports, information from teachers, NAPLAN results where possible, um, all of that's really helpful because often with ADHD, one of the main areas you see the impact is in the classroom. Not always, there's masking, but often that's where you see it. So it's really important to see. Um, and then medical. So we want to make sure that kids have had the hearing check, their vision check, that they've seen a GP or a paediatrician to rule out any other potential underlying issues um, to make sure that, you know, there's nothing else that could be explaining it going on. Um, and then, yes, psychometric tests if there's suspected cognitive difficulties going on. So how do we assess? What do we do? Um, again, not do they have ADHD, but what explains them? Um, and we need to be open to a range of hypotheses. So even if someone is referred specifically for ADHD or autism or anxiety or learning difficulties, we try to be open to the possibility that anything could actually be explaining the child's underlying difficulties or the adult teens. Um, and so we explore all of these. And so we look at a long, strong family history, any other disabilities or genetic stuff that's going on, any potential trauma, any other mental health, and any known learning difficulties that are going on because all of this adds to the picture. So then we send pre-assessment questionnaires before we even meet the parents and kids. So we get information from the parents and the teachers. And when the child is um, a teenager or older, um, we get self-report as well. Um, and all of this information is used to help us know what to follow through on and what to ask further in our clinical interviews. We also ask families to send through all of the information they can. So um, referrals from doctors, um, pediatricians, school reports, NAPLAN, allied health reports, like a whole lot of information so we can catch what else might be going on. Because too often um, in the past, uh, in other places I've worked or in other systems, um, when people came in for a linear assessment of do they meet this, you'd get to the very end of assessment and someone would be like, oh, and there's this, and that changes the whole picture. So it's really important to me that you get as much information as you can before you even start the assessment to ensure that you are assessing with the full picture in place. Um, then in the in-depth parent interview, um, it's that full developmental history, a full medical background, a full like family history, schooling experiences, home behaviours, um, and additional screeners for the other areas that are con of concern that may be identified through this process or the screeners. So maybe we need to do a strength and difficulties, an anxiety screener, depression screener, um, whatever else we think needs to be explored in depth to either rule out or potentially as a, another explanation for what's going on for the child. Um, then with the young person. So as much as you also need to have some structured clinical intervention, it's important to have play and actually see how the young person interacts because some kids can appear ADHD when you first meet them because they're anxious and it's a new environment, they don't know what's going on. As they settle, um, their focus and attention actually improves. For other kids, they are masking and so they'll be very compliant and do exactly what you want, but you can see they look nervous. And then if you get them comfortable and, you know, we have lots of fidgets around the place, let them know that they can use the fidgets and that sort of thing. As they relax, sometimes they do um, display more of those characteristics of ADHD that you'd expect. And so it's looking at the pattern of the child's behaviour across a full assessment time. Um, so we have one to two hours with the child and sometimes two sessions depending on what we're looking at. 
Um, and then we do in-depth questioning as well with the child. So depending on their age, obviously age-appropriate questioning um, and some self-reports where, where um, applicable. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with masking, masking is um, also seen in autism but is not unique to autism. Um, and it's where someone is trying to do the right thing. So it's commonly more commonly seen in the female presentation. So they work very hard to do what is expected and what is right rather than being their natural selves. So often if someone is masking, you'll see like overcompliance or a lack of um, pushback or resistance to anything. Um, and so if you push someone a bit further and they're being compliant beyond what you'd expect a typical child to be compliant with, you can, you know, hypothesis, are they masking? And so it's good to explore if that's there. Um, and another sign of masking is having high rates of anxiety anxiety symptoms showing, especially in the school environment, and then those meltdowns at home. Um, now, cognitive assessment. Under the DSM-4 and previously, you almost always did a cognitive assessment for ADHD. Um, it's not required in the DSM anymore. Um, however, it is often useful to do because most of the time when school-aged children are referred for ADHD, the biggest concern is um, difficulties learning and attainments in the classroom. And so often the question is, is ADHD or a learning difficulty? And so we have to assess for cognition to ensure that, you know, there's not a low IQ that's explaining difficulties in the classroom or um, they're not gifted and are bored in the classroom and therefore displaying these behaviours. And, of course, you can have an intellectual disability and ADHD or be gifted and have ADHD, um, but it can be um, good to look into that. Um, but as I said, we don't do it every time, um, partly because it's a lot of hard work for the child and bigger expense for the parents. So we only add in cognitive assessments where there's clinical uh, reason to do so. Um, so then what do we do after we've done all the assessments? So we actually do some in-depth work behind the scenes before we get back to the family. So we do a dif differential review and a synthesis of all the information. So as I said before, we actually draw out the Venn diagrams of all the potential hypotheses and map out the symptoms where they fall in that Venn diagram. So we can see, are there unique symptoms to ADHD or is it overlapping with other disorders? And if they're stuck across, do they meet criteria for multiple diagnoses? Because as I said before, so common comorbidities with um, ADHD are autism, learning difficulties, anxiety, sleep difficulties, um, mood, particularly in teenagers, so depression or um, bipolar and things like that. So there's lots of things to explore depending on their presentation and to me really important to ensure that it's not just do they meet the criteria of ADHD, but is that the right um, reason behind that list of traits that we're seeing. And so that's where we develop the child's neurocognitive profile. And so we actually explain what this child is um, functioning like. We talk about their strengths and their differences um, and look at how that's functionally impacting them because obviously to have a diagnosis, it needs to be significantly impairing them. Um, but it's important to remember that the functional impairment may not be obvious um, from the outside. So a lot of the kids who get diagnosed at an older age are because they've internalised the impact of ADHD. So there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of perfectionism, um, difficulties with sleep, shutting down, relaxing, because all of the ADHD is internalised. Um, and so the functional impact can be mental health, lack of relaxation, difficulty, you know, having friendships because they're overthinking everything, uh, rejection, sensitivity, um, all of that sort of thing. And then once we've got their full profile and we've looked at all of that information, we uh, include formal diagnosis. So against the DSM-5 criteria, if applicable, we put in the formal diagnosis um, alongside the bigger, more descriptive picture of who the child is. Um, and then we meet with the parents to share this report and go through the information, and explain their child's neurotype and provide information and resources. Um, we actually provide all um, of our families with a relevant book to explain the child's neurotypes, whether it's autism or ADHD or combined or anxiety or learning difficulties, we have books. Um, and we encourage the child to attend their own feedback session following the parent session um, so they can hear about their diagnosis and we have an abbreviated letter for the child. A few of their strengths and a few of their difficulties and 
three things that can help them. Um, and we also gift the children their own little fidget that they can use and to help make the process a positive learning experience and how they can, you know, understand themselves and thrive rather than it being a, a bad thing. And so with our recommendations, there's lots of accommodations and interventions we recommend in terms of other services and what they can be doing in the home and the school to support the child, um, referring back to the referring practitioner where appropriate. Um, and we always recommend a medical review, um, partly obviously because medication is one of the most um, common uh, interventions to ADHD, so important that they explore those options. Um, and also sometimes we may encourage medical review for um, comorbid um, symptoms such as sleep difficulties, which are very common. Um, incontinence, also quite common in ADHD, so some referrals to the incontinence clinic um, and any other allied health, so often OT referrals if there's a lot of sensory stuff going on. Um, yes, and... I'm not sure if they're getting shared with you, but if they're not, I can send them through just some references on the information I have gotten my um, stats and information on the process of assessment. And that's it for me, Leonie. Fabulous. Um, I think we're back to Joe now. Is that right, Joe? Uh, yeah, that's right, Leonie. Yeah. I'm just um, sharing my screen. Is that back to me? Have you got my slides up now? Yes, we do. Yeah, great. Thanks, Carla. Look, that's a great segue for a number of reasons to the phenomena of ADHD in women and girls because Carla really stressed a couple of things there which I think were important. One was the co-occurring conditions are incredibly common. So the diagnostic process is necessarily complex to really fully understand. And women and girls tend to be at the internalising end. Um, one of the distinctions people make with ADHD is that younger, typically boys, but not always, tend to be disruptive and at the kind of hyperactive impulsive end, which means they become problematic for other people and are picked up quite early and through, you know, through the last 30 or 40 years, certainly um, it's been that set of children who've been identified, whereas women and girls are much more likely to be picked up later and more commonly when they present with mental health issues. Um, what we understand about some of the gender differences are uh, that... Um, um, Females are more likely to be at the inattentive end of the spectrum uh, with a greater risk of associated poor self-esteem, demoralisation, and certainly you see that in some of the teenage girls at school who've tried, who are bright, creative, um, engaged human beings who really um, try, try and engage academically but find their executive function skills are just not supporting them in that endeavour are much more likely to present with anxiety and depressive um, symptoms. I'm going to talk a little bit more about hormone. The, the, um, the research has it um, um, uh, extends to hormone challenges. Um, masking and modelling is, um, again, as Carla was saying, um, much less likely to be identified as having ADHD or be medicated for inattentive symptoms. Impulsivity in women can look quite different from a how, how it appears in men and might be related to more emotional dysregulation, binge eating, substance use, unplanned pregnancy, self-harm, suicidality and intimate partner violence. Um, there is this growing body of evidence that oestrogen is um, um, neuroactive and can modulate uh, executive functions, including concentration, focus, sleep, um, and that um, ADHD symptoms can be modulated by those fluctuations. Um, some women are diagnosed with ADHD in their menopause all years as oestrogen um, um, decreases. And uh, some 
younger women with um, described fluctuations in their ADHD symptoms related to their menstrual cycle. Um, at the moment, my understanding is that there isn't a lot of evidence for using hormonal therapies, but that's certainly an active area of interest. Um, Attitude, who are an American um, uh, community uh, support network for people with ADHD, have published quite a lot about women and um, ADHD recently, including a number of podcasts. They've put together this um, um, fact sheet, which is, is freely available, uh, describing some of the challenges that can be related to hormonal fluctuations. I thought we'd move on to co-occurring conditions. And just to remind people that ADHD is part of the neurodiversity platform, which means you're much more likely in a child diagnosed with ADHD to see many of the other um, features of neurodiversity, including autistic features, even if it's insufficient for a diagnosis, um, tics, anxiety, learning disorders, um, um, other developmental and um, motor skills issues. Uh, and again, just to emphasise the importance of the diagnostic process to really clarify uh, which of these issues are contributing to a child's presentation um, and also which um, where management can be targeted. Um, ADHD is much more likely, well, it, it, it's thought that about two thirds of people with ADHD can be diagnosed with a with an additional mental health diagnosis, and up to eighteen percent of people with ADHD have three or more co-occurring conditions. So, the it's certainly um, my um, um, through my experience, it's often the co-occurring conditions that are more challenging to manage particularly if there's a late diagnosis and demoralisation, shame, uh, anxiety and depression are prominent features. Uh, what are these co-occurring conditions? These are diagnosable conditions. Um, and again, the men are in blue and women are in red. Um, this is a huge, big population-based study from Denmark. If you've got a diagnosis of ADHD, you're much more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety, autism, bipolar, um, oppositionality and conduct disorder, depression, eating disorders, intellectual disability, personality disorder, um, schizophrenia, um, some unexpected death, suicidal behaviours and tic disorder. Uh, and you can see some of the sex-related, the gender-related patterns there where women are much more likely to have mood issues and um, boys perhaps more likely for, to have autism and ODD. Um, the comorbidities change with age. So the darker bars, the darker blue bars are young children, 6 to 12. The teal bars are 13 to 18-year-olds. And the pink bars are people more than 18-year-olds, more than 18 and so if you have a diagnosis of ADHD, you notice this pink bar, which um, relates, uh, which is the percentage of people who also have comorbid anxiety, depression, substance use, becomes quite high in um, adulthood. And the, um, the, the risk of childhood disorders, obviously, like oppositionality, reduces. Um, this is interesting recent research. It's a meta-analysis of the association between learning disorders and ADHD published in 2021. I think the interesting data, which I've highlighted in yellow, so that's my highlighting, not studies, is that these are boys and girls divided across three columns without ADHD and with ADHD the chance that you've got a, re a specific learning disorder in reading or dyslexia if you're a boy without ADHD is about 15.4% and with ADHD it's 25%. And for girls, similar numbers. I think some of the, some of the quite interesting um, data here 
is that if you're a girl with ADHD, the chance that you meet the diagnostic criteria for a specific learning disorder in maths or dyscalculia is 41%. Um, and th this, this points to the, uh, again, points to that diagnostic, the importance of that diagnostic process. Um, some of the co-occurring um, tendencies are time blindness, this tendency to kind of get distracted and lost and not have the same sense of time as other people. And this is a pretty common situation a lot of parents would find that um, in the middle of the night, assignments are uncovered. Procrastination is a huge feature of predominant, particularly predominantly inattentive ADHD. It's something that adults really struggle with. Um, and if you think back to some of those psychological characteristics that we discussed earlier, there's a strong preference for high stimulation activities with certainty and um, uh, procrastination is thought to occur because of an avoidance of uncertainty and overwhelm at the size of a task. Um, and some of the management um, strategies that can be helpful for procrastination are to divide, to, to use the knowledge that you are reward seeking to uh, break tasks up and make them more inherently rewarding. Um, sleep and ADHD, as Carla mentioned, is a huge kind of overlap. Obstructive sleep apnea is the medical condition that looks most like ADHD. And um, um, in children, one of the biggest um, uh, symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea is um, uh, a lack of kind of executive function skill during the day. Um, sleep difficulties with ADHD, the majority of people with ADHD would describe some difficulties with sleep and up to 50% could be diagnosed with a sleep disorder like delayed sleep phase, sleep association disorder, um, insomnia, parasomnias. Um, um, and and that's not to mention some of the toileting issues. Um, and I heard a very good description the other day. If you look at the that concept of intolerance of boredom, to someone with ADHD, going to bed and trying to go to sleep can be inherently boring. Um, and the management strategy uh, could include having low-grade stimulation, uh, oral stimulation or um, um uh, listening to something that you've listened to previously to provide a low level of stimulation. Um, ADHD is associated with restless legs and iron deficiency. And the assessment of um, the medical assessment of children with ADHD will often include a set of baseline bloods to exclude things like iron deficiency, knowing that it can be uh, associated with um, um, some of these medical issues. Um, oppositionality, uh, is another feature of ADHD. If you think about, um, difficulty with impulse control and emotional regulation, often at the cusp of ADHD in children with anxiety, you, you could meet the criteria for oppositional defiance disorder, um, which I think of as an allergy to authority and the sense that you've got diminished control over the world. Um, Russell Barkley writes a lot about ODD and has a program um, to manage ODD. And his statistic is that it exists with ADHD almost 100% of the time. But people with ADHD, children with ADHD, have ODD, could be diagnosed with ODD in about 25 to 40% of cases. Um, they are separate conditions which are managed differently. Uh, the criteria for oppositional defiance disorder is that for at least four, six months, there's four of these features, frequently losing temperature, arguing, defiant behaviour, blaming others, touchy, easily irritated, easily annoyed, angry, resentful, spiteful. And you can see there's a, quite a significant overlap with what you might expect from an anxious child. Um, 
it's useful to um, uh, reflect on how some of those issues might be addressed. Um, previously, neurodivergence, that combination of ADHD, ASD, various other things, was thought to be a, um, a, a disorder um, and not fitting in with normal, with whatever that means. Uh, and the focus was on remediating deficits. The parenting model that works kind of better now would be um, that neurodivergence seems an opportunity to embrace diversity um, with a greater focus on individual strengths and leveraging um, um, individual differences and leveraging their strengths while building skills. And um, Ross Green, who has this website, Lives in the Balance, and wrote the book, The Explosive Child, um, has a very uh, useful parenting approach which is uh, available through his website, uh, at least initially, and you have access to his um, um, theories by through his books, which is moving from power and control and the problems of, you know, establishing power and control in relationships to collaboration and problem solving. Um, and this um, checklist, which is available on in the Lives in the Balance um, website, helps parents understand the opportunities they have in terms of skills deficits. Uh, so not so much describing them as problems, but where are the skill shortages? And the other issue that he asks parents to reflect on is where are the expectation gaps? Like what's reasonable to expect from a child? How can you articulate your expectations as a way of better understanding where resources might be um, um, best um, best targeted? Oppositional defiance is largely managed through um, parenting and behavioural techniques. Sometimes um, medication is useful. Um, certainly the most effective first line strategy would be to manage ADHD because impulse control is improved. And that can be quite helpful for emotional regulation. Sometimes atypical antipsychotics, things like risperidone and aripiprazole are used. Um, obviously there's um, some complexity there in terms of side effects. Uh, and with medications, I would always encourage behavioral support. Um, ticks and Tourette's um, body-focused repetitive behaviours are another uh, association with um, ADHD. Uh, ticks are sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic, stereotype, motor or um, uh, vocal uh, movements uh, occurring many times of the day and often occurring at times of stress or boredom. Um, they tend to wax and wane. Um, there's an association with ADHD and with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so children with anxiety are more likely to have tics. It's particularly uh, relevant because there's concern. There's a, a legitimate concern that stimulant medications that are used for ADHD can worsen tics in the same way that there are other um, issues that worsen tics. And um, this uh, Forest Park from 2015 is a meta-analysis of a number of studies looking for evidence that stimulants do worsen ticks. And the, 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 the um, summary of this study is essentially they didn't find evidence. In practice, I think what I find is that ticks can worsen for a short amount of time. It's important because even 10 years ago when I was training, it was thought that if children had ticks, they should not start stimulants. Whereas now, on the basis of these kinds of studies and the importance of stimulant medications to so many children, um, stimulants are used, but they might be commenced more slowly or more gently or with the cover of an alpha-2 agonist or um, um, in during the holidays so that if ticks do... Um, um, occur or increase 
uh, there's less of an impact. Uh, body focus repetitive behaviours, uh, those skin picking, nail biting, hair pulling, um, um, hair pulling kind um, types of behaviours, increasingly recognised and managed, um, uh, good and good to talk about because uh, often children will do these things and. Um, one of the uh, behaviours that reinforces those behaviours is parents kind of getting annoyed or um, uh, pointing those behaviours out because it's thought to be reinforcing, which is the same with ticks. And I, I kind of feel like they're a, um, a similar behavioural characteristic with more consciousness around body-focused repetitive behaviours than ticks. Uh, habit reversal therapy can be useful for both conditions. Um, uh, trichotillomania, where, which is associated with hair pulling, uh, is particularly difficult because of the impact. Um, um, and the more that you worry about it, uh, the more you're likely to do it because it is a stress-relieving activity and behaviour. Um, there's a whole uh, process with all of these body-focused repetitive behaviours, it's not just the pulling out, it's the manipulation of whatever is um, um, pulled. So habit reversal therapy I, seeks to identify the urges behind some of those behaviours and then replace the behaviour with something that's less um, functionally impairing um, or cosmetically difficult, uh, but re re respecting that it's a whole series of behaviours that need to be um, um, replaced very briefly, and I showed this slide um, in the uh, autism discussion. Um, there's a lot of evidence that eating disorders are more likely to occur with neurodivergent children. At the autistic end, it's anorexia, and at the ADHD end, it's more likely to be binge eating and bulimia um, type behaviours, which are related to impulsive impulse control. Um, Substance use and ADHD is, again, an area of concern, not just because medications are, stimulant medications are um, often diverted, um, but people with ADHD are much more likely during their adult years to become substance using. Um, and the statistic in this study from the early 2000s is that 52% of adults um, with ADHD are more, uh, will develop a substance use disorder and 27% of adults without. So if ADHD is treated, that risk falls by 84%. And essentially the following slides are reinforcing that message. Um, childhood ADHD is related to both future cigarette smoking and substance use disorder. Um, these are adults with ADHD um women and men um so if you're an adult with an, with ADHD um a female adult with ADHD you, the chance that you'll be smoking is around 40 percent um this is older data and it's probably reduced now um the general population if you're a woman is kind of in the mid-20s more if you're a man but the, the other difficulty is that the quit ratio uh, is is re significantly reduced. Um, uh, substance use in adults with ADHD, again, non-medicated ADHD, this is adolescence, is a 75% risk of um, some substance use. If you're medicated, that risk falls to 25%. That's that, when they talked about the 84% risk reduction, that's what they're reflecting and non-medication, non-ADHD controlled adolescents. Um, stimulant treatment of ADHD in youth was associated with a twofold reduction in the risk for substance use disorder. Uh, and it's a complex issue because, um, because of the concern regarding stimulant medication uh, reinforcing substance use. Uh, early ADHD treatment reduces marijuana use um, the other area of interest is around accidents, mortality and morbidity in ADHD. And there's a lot of evidence 
um, again, through those Scandinavian studies, that um, most um, ADHD is strongly associated with uh, increased mortality and morbidity. There's particular evidence around car accidents um, compared to drivers without ADHD. Drivers with ADHD are much more likely to drive without a licence, have their licence revoked or suspended, suspended, have multiple crashes and multiple traffic citations, particularly for speeding. They're much more likely than other drivers to rate themselves poorly on their driving habits uh, and to be legally at fault in car accidents. Um, more likely to be involved with severe accidents and killed in um, car crashes. And adolescents are at high risk anyway. I always think that it's kind of quite useful to talk to people about these. Some of these risks are kind of scary when you say them, um, but I do. I, I make a point when um, young people are learning to drive, just so that they understand what some of their modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for car accidents um, are, uh, because obviously the the, the um, association between car accidents and being distracted on phones and having friends in the car increases that risk multiple fold, um, and they're they're more modifiable things. Um, interventions. In terms of interventions, I think about it in four groups. The first group, I think, is is related to education and self awareness. And I I feel like when I see young people with ADHD, um, I think it's very important that over time their self awareness builds. What does this mean about my brain? Um, what's my brain naturally good at? What are the things that um, um, create complexity in my life, particularly in the school setting? How does this affect my social um, relationships? What what usefulness is medication to me? Um, what are the days like when I take medication versus don't take medication? And I think that's a long process. Parent education, I always direct people to Russell Barclay's books and attitude because I think it gives them a choice of listening to things or reading things. Um, school accommodations and supports, and this is where the uh, a good diagnostic um, uh, report is very helpful to help guide teachers around um, and schools around supports. Um, there's obviously evidence for ADHD coaching, occupational therapy, wellbeing support, and medication. Some of the non-medication strategies are around parenting. Um, cognitive therapies, and this is becoming increasingly important, particularly as more adults are diagnosed with ADHD. Um, medication gets you so far and only works for a certain period of time. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot more support around executive dysfunction in adults, um, and a, a series of apps and online supports. More people are trained in cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, this is quite a popular book by an American um, um, psychologist. Uh, and learning how to manage working memory um, deficits, for example, um, you know, can be helpful. Wellbeing for ADHD, like for most human beings, is around making sure that you exercise, sleep well, eat well, practice self-compassion, have connection, um, practice gratitude or compassion, green and blue space exposure, um, and that that that's another strong message around the whole family um, of um, uh, people affected by ADHD. There's more evidence um, around exercise improving ADHD symptoms. When I was doing my um, um, advanced training project. I, I, I wrote um, my thesis on exercise in ADHD and um, certainly there's evolving evidence. Uh, this is a study of how academic improvement improves with um, academic um, um, uh, improve with exercise. It, tend, it seems to be temporally associated. So before you do a task, 
Um, and I think it's the same uh, evidence that's evolving for dementia and various other cognitive impairments. Um, medication strategies. There's guidelines around the world. They all say very similar things, um, similar to our guidelines here in Australia. Unless there's a reason not to, stimulants are, are very helpful for ADHD. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that. The second line and third line treatments in Tunu, um, which is an alpha-2 agonist, quite, quite helpful for emotional regulation, works for 24 hours. Um, Atomoxetin, previously Stratera, which isn't available in Australia now, is an SNRI, um, helpful at that cusp of ADHD and anxiety. Um, uh, uh, but second and third line, because they're nowhere near as effective, for core ADHD symptoms of stimulants. Um, the stimulants that are available in Australia, there's five, short-acting Ritalin, Ritalin LA, which is a six to eight hour one, and Concerta, which is kind of an eight to 10 hour preparation. The dexamphetamine based ones are short-acting Dex, uh, which is three to four hours, and Vyvanse, which is the most recent one, which can last between about 18, uh, eight and 12 hours. Um, in America, for comparison, um, there's 55 different stimulants in various forms. And um, um, this is one of the two pages that most paediatricians and child psychiatrists would have in their office to kind of help them work out which one they might try. There's patches, liquids. Um, the newer stimulant medications in America uh, have a have a higher dose in the morning um, and lower doses in the afternoon, so better tailored to some particularly young children's days. Most of the evidence for stimulant medication comes from this MTA study, which is which is just reported its thirty five year follow up. Um, initially, the, the early evidence was that medication alone, compared to medication with behavioural treatment. Um, was equally effective. I think as behavioural treatment and cognitive therapies and um, more wellbeing awareness, as that evidence, as that um, um, has been improved over time with our better understanding of ADHD, uh, that this this type of approach wouldn't would would not necessarily be true now. Um, effect sizes of ADHD medications. So first line stimulants, the effect size can be up to 1.8 and just compare that to SSRIs for, map, for depression and anxiety where the effect size might be 0.39 to 0.5. And then if you use an alpha 2 agonist, so this is guanfacine or infunid, the effect size is 1.1 and stratera or atomoxetin is lower again. Um, and there's a difference between... Um, uh, stimulant medication effect sizes, um, uh, depending on how finely tuned that process is and tailored to an individual child. Um, there are contraindications to stimulants and they are around cardiac concerns because it is pro-arrhythmic and there are specific conditions where you would seek cardiology um, opinion, and they would include Wolf, Parkinson, White, Regatta, Long QT, cardiac neuropathy, um, heart failure, congenital heart disease, um, and a, a, a cardiac murmur that you hear for the first time, um, hypertension on examination, um, a first degree relative with sudden cardiac death, which is suggestive of one of those prorhythmic conditions, and syncopal events without a clear cause. Um, stimulant dosing, just before we get on to um, uh, the stimulant um, prescribing in the ACP, stimulant dosing is highly variable. It's not predicted by weight, age, gender or severity scores. Um, some, some people are very sensitive to stimulants and low doses work really well. Some people need much higher doses. Um, dosing does change with age and um, um, growth, but not not as significantly. It, that, that's not as significant a, um, a driver of dosing than uh, sensitivity. 
um, this uh, guideline, um, uh, which hasn't really changed a lot, is the, if you if you reach the age of sixteen, then you're probably stable in terms of dosing after that. Um, but I think there's a complex interplay of the demands of your day and you know what 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 kind of stimulant might suit you um, for the activities that you're trying to cover. Um, just very briefly about stimulant, one of the um, I always think what we love in paediatrics is old-fashioned medications that we know, you know, we've got a long experience in terms of um, side effects. Um, so we're not going to have a new side effect um, um, uh, come up. It, amphetamine, which was known as Benzedrine, uh, was isolated in 1910 and manufactured in 1937 put on the market in 1935 as a treatment for narcolepsy, and it still has a PBS approval for narcolepsy, oh, but also used for depression, Parkinsonianism, um, and uh, many other neurological disorders because the psychotropic revolution um, didn't occur until the 1950s. So old-fashioned old medications like this um, were used quite a lot. The first description of the use of stimulants in children was in 1937 when they were being used at a children's home by Charles Bradley, whose picture is up in the corner, um, for headaches, for headache treatment. And what he identified and published was that of those children, there was a spectacular change in behaviour um, with remarkably improved school performance during the one week of trialling Benzedrine. Um, Ritalin was uh, synthesised in 1944 and named after the inventor's wife, Rita, uh, and it was synthesised initially to help chronic fatigue, lethargy, depressive states, senile behaviours, psychosis associated with depression and narcolepsy, um, and, and very quickly realised that um, uh, m more helpful for um, uh, children who'd been described as... Um, uh, as having those executive function difficulties. I'm going to hand over to uh, Amanda now. Um, and we only will introduce Amanda, um, but we're very happy to have her um, join us to talk about stimulant prescribing in the US. In, Thank in you. The US. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. That was really, really interesting. Um, so on to our last speaker. Our last speaker is Amanda Galbraith. Amanda is a registered community pharmacist. She has previously owned community pharmacies as well as worked within GP practices as a credentialed diabetes educator. Amanda is currently the acting chief pharmacist and senior director at ACT Health. Amanda's team provides regulatory support for prescribers and pharmacists. The team provides prescribers with a chief health officer CHO approvals, which we all know about, for prescribing controlled medicines and oversees the implementation of Canberra Script, the ACT's version of real-time prescribing monitoring, which is um, happening soon, I think. So thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you, Leone, um, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, for Joe asking me, it was fabulous. Um, I did think, as an aside, that I knew most of the medications on the market that were named after somebody's family member, but I didn't know about Rita and Ritalin, so that's a new one for me. I think uh, tonight I just wanted to cover off some of the things that have been uh, raised frequently with my team and myself over the last few months around prescribing of stimulants for ADHD. So we're definitely seeing an increase in applications for CHO approvals for stimulants. Now, there are most about 51% of the team's work is for stimulants, and about 97% of that being for ADHD, with of course a small spattering for things like narcolepsy and the like. Uh, but an ever increasing amount of work is being done uh, in approving stimulant scripts for us. And of course, we want to acknowledge the challenges everyone's experiencing with a shortage of both uh, paediatric and psychiatrist appointments in the ACT and the challenges that that is creating for uh, GPs in Canberra, as well as for um, the existing specialists. And interesting to note that at the moment, we're starting to see a rebound of patients who may have 
seen a telehealth prescriber during the COVID period, but maybe now are finding it difficult to reconnect with that prescriber and some of the impacts that's causing in the ACT. I do want to mention that we acknowledge the desire for change for both prescribers and patients in the ACT for how stimulant prescribing is done. And I think uh, Jo mentioned it earlier, but of course the Senate inquiry into access and support for people with ADHD was released a couple of weeks ago and there were quite a number of recommendations. But for those of you who didn't see them, the key ones from my point of view would be recommendation four, which was asking the Commonwealth to consider reviewing the PBS approval criteria for um, stimulant medications. Recommendation five was for the jurisdictions to consider uniformity of prescribing across um, borders. And uh, recommendation 12 was around scope of practice. So for um, all clinicians, obviously, we're looking for uh, work, everyone working to the top of their scope and for GPs and nurse practitioners, whether there is potential scope for prescribing and or diagnostics um, for ADHD medications. Uh, the key one from my point of view, of course, is the uniformity across jurisdictions. And it's fair to say that that sounds like a very easy thing to achieve, uh, but in reality is quite a challenge. Um, we are definitely looking with my colleagues across the jurisdictions as to how we may review this piece of work. And uh, it's definitely something that is a watching brief for us. If I can talk about the challenges that um, GPs particularly are finding in getting their patients back for review um, to specialists, the team here will support prescribers as best we can. Um, so if you are having challenges, we don't want to see patients going without um, medication and treatment if needed, but um, also we'd ask you all to be on the front foot about ensuring that they have a specialist appointment coming that that specialist is able to see them uh, and uh, support them as best we can because of course we know that one of the characteristics of patients with ADHD uh, is that procrastination piece and leaving things to the last minute which uh, whilst we acknowledge that characteristic does make it very difficult for prescribers and my team here to manage those approvals. Uh, we'll always try and do what we can as best we can. Uh, and then I just wanted to add, because I'm sure probably it's better for others at the end of the speech to just um, throw questions at me, but we would encourage you all to please access and utilise CanberraScript. Uh, CanberraScript is the ACT's version of real-time prescription monitoring. The systems are all essentially the same platform across the country, um, but they all have their own front-facing name and ours is CanberraScript. Approval applications through CanberraScript are the most efficient way for my team here to get back to you in a timely manner. So I would encourage you, if you haven't previously, to register and or look at and or seek education and support from my team for how to use Canberra Script to submit your applications. And uh, that certainly is much uh, simpler than other manners um, of applying for approval. Um, I think uh, Leonie, I'll leave it there and maybe allow questions as they come. Um, I, th I think uh, joe has got a couple more slides, though, perhaps. That's correct. So um, we'll go back to Joe and then we'll um, go to questions. Um, thanks, Amanda. That was um, very interesting. Um, and I have to say that I'm one of the people that needs to get onto Canberra Script. Um, just to kind of keep um, on the stimulant um, um, on the stimulant um, um, trajectory for a minute, common side effects of stimulants, the most common are related to appetite suppression and sleep onset difficulties, particularly if the stimulants in your system, um, for too long a time. Um, appetite suppression can result in growth suppression. Uh, agitation is a really common side effect while you're trialling the medication, which is often why um, that, that's very, that can be a slow process. 
uh, and the agitation can occur either while the stimulant is in your system or as it wears off. Um, a lot of people describe a zombie state, which is a flat affect and a feeling of disconnection uh, using stimulant medication. And this is often related to a dose and, and those brains that are just quite sensitive um, to stimulants. So lower doses can work quite well with um, when that um, side effect is in place. Uh, there are other somatic complaints. I talk a lot about the balance of side effects and benefits um, and uh, the, sometimes there's, um, there's finessing you can do around dosing and timing, which um, can be helpful for the side effects that are experienced. Um, I've covered um, the non-stimulant medications, um, so I won't go back over that. Something I think that is under-recognised and uh, potentially useful um, is that there's quite well-established data for the use of fish oil um, uh, and uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, for, for, the, for the concentration part of um, um, ADHD. Uh, the studies use one gram and the EPA component is more important than the DHA component. Um, the final slide, which I won't go through, is a summary of that meta-analysis that was done in 2018, just clarifying the usefulness of fish oil. Um, my understanding of the uh, research currently is that there are no other over-the-counter uh, compounds that have been shown um, to be useful with robust evidence, although obviously um, there's emerging evidence for um, other um, compounds. Um, now, that's the end of these slides. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. And I'm obviously, we're happy ready to take questions. Ready to go? Okay, here we go. Uh, so I think this one's for you, Joe. So we'll pepper them out amongst the panellists. But the first one is, is the increase in prevalence a result of more diagnosis being made or an increase in the background disease itself? And if it's an increase in the background disease itself, why has that occurred? I think it's more awareness. Um, and I think if you look at the groups that are being diagnosed more, it's people at the inattentive end of the spectrum, women, um, um, other more disadvantaged groups. I, I think recently there's a significant um, social media uh, aspect to increased prevalence. I don't think there's evidence that our brains are changing and that we have um, more, you know, that, that, that there's more ADHD um, um, coming to fore. But I do think that ADHD is a bit of a mismatch thing. The demands of the day just don't suit a lot of people's executive function skills. And whereas previously there was more activity in our day, just general physical activity, where some of those symptoms might not have been as problematic or education might have been, you know, less structured, um, more, um, uh, more physically demanding. I think um, that, that it, it, the executive function skills um, of a lot of people with ADHD are more obvious in more structured or the expectation of more structured environments. And I think I about what other people think, Carl. I think to add to that, yeah, I think it's also important to remember that the change from DSM four to DSM five made a huge increase in ADHD diagnosis in the autistic population. Exactly, yeah, because they weren't getting the ADHD diagnosis yeah, they previously. ADHD. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And what about um? There's lots of people who talk about how screens kind of um that short attention span and the kind of immediate gratification of looking at screens and texting has uh, brought out ADHD behaviours that might also have been masked? 
You know what I find fascinating? I spend a lot of time researching this because it's like the number one uh, concern of all parents um, and number one thing I get in the clinic. Um, and some recent research which has been fascinating and I've had a lot of, uh, you know, success with clients is that for the ADHD is because they're that, um, it's that dip. It's a deficit in being able to choose where you direct your attention. And so because TV and screens are all-consuming, they get in that hyper-focus to the point that they actually um, lose the ability to know how much time has passed, whether they're hungry, whether they need to go to the toilet, and then you turn the screen or tech off and people think that they're raging because the screen's off. What's actually happening is they're completely dysregulated because they're hungry, they need to wee, they've got no idea how much time's Mm -hmm. gone, and they're being still which is the opposite of what their body needs. And so um, if you actually put movement breaks into tech, it decreases heaps of those issues. That's very interesting. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to hear that screens are not completely evil. No. Um, Um, We've got another question. They can run while they... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have another question. Maybe this one is uh, for you, Carla. Is can you share the names of books you recommend for parents and children? Um, do you on your slides? I can't remember. Um, did you have a list of books They're on not them when you had on there? But yep. what I can say is that at the moment we've just put a whole bunch of resources to our web designer. We're uploading a section on our website where all the stuff we recommend will be accessible. But off the top of my head. Um, if we're looking for kids, um, The Brain Forest from Sendai and Menon is awesome. Or My Brain is a Race Car by Neil Harris. Um, I can flick a few things through in um, a doc for you guys to share when you share slides. Okay, that'd be great. Yep. yep. Yeah, we are going to send out the slides next week to attendees. And then I think you mentioned, Joe, um, the book by Barclay. Uh, yes. Yeah, Russell Barclay's book, um, Taking yeah. Charge of ADHD. Yeah. It's yeah. It, yeah, a lot of people talk about it. It's a very practically helpful book um, yeah. by someone who's kind of been writing in the area for a long time. I also yeah. like um, All Dogs Have ADHD um, <laughs> because I think that it's 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 easy to kind of access and kids might read it and. You know, the, it takes away some of the judgment that they're making yeah. around behaviours and we don't expect dogs to act differently. We we shouldn't expect neurodiverse kids to act differently. And if you're talking yep. resources, um, the How to ADHD website by yeah. Jessica McCarb is phenomenal. Yeah. Bite size on very yeah. specific stuff. Yeah. 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 And there's also that Attitudes website as well. Yes, that that's mentioned. my favourite, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yep. Um, okay, uh, so would it be true to say that a referral for an assessment for ADHD should not be done under a mental health plan, but what, that once the diagnosis is made, a mental health plan can be used for um, support strategies? So mental health care plans, according to Medicare, are only to be used for mental health treatment. ADHD doesn't actually fall under mental health because it's a neurodevelopmental. However, depends on why they're seeing the psychologist. If they're seeing a psychologist for the anxiety, which is co-occurring with ADHD, absolutely they can have a mental health care plan for anxiety. Um, so I have a lot of my clients with ADHD have co-membered other disabilities like autism things, and so they're seeing it under NDIS but I do have some more high-functioning older clients who are seeing me under mental health care plans for anxiety. And then there are some unfortunate people with ADHD who don't have a mental health difficulty or a coma with disability. And so what they're needing is more like practical strategy for ADHD. And they don't actually fall under anything. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question is, uh, this is the hoary chestnut, um, of course, that, both of you, I think, mentioned. So I'm curious about it, and Amanda also mentioned it. I'm curious about assessment options in the ACT. I have a number of clients with strongly suspected ADHD. However, getting an assessment is generally prohibitively expensive. Where should I direct cut clients seeking assessment, and are there any cost-effective options? Well, can I just say, I think at school, if it, in the paediatric age group, um, a lot of schools can be really helpful. Um, is it a fabulous, detailed, comprehensive 
um, um, assessment that's going to last forever? Probably not. Um, but th that that is a first step for a lot of families. And I think that's it. Like if it's quite clearly ADHD, uh, you know, some teacher and parent screeners to a good paediatrician is probably the cheapest, fastest way to get the results. But when you've got complex, you know, a psychological assessment is fantastic. But unfortunately, they are expensive because, as I said, to get all of that comprehensive information is a lot of time. And we don't have enough people in this space in Canberra, so there aren't many options. If you're looking for cost effective in the private, um, I would look for people who have provisionals doing assessments because it is cheaper provided they've got a good supervisor. But then if it's too complex for a provisional, you need to go to it's there's no good answer, unfortunately. And the universities, the University yes. of Canberra have a psychology yes. um, department, um, well supervised students, and often that can be uh, a helpful. Uh, way of reducing cost. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, if a patient is diagnosed by a New South Wales specialist, does their script have to be dispensed in New South Wales? I don't think that's the case because there's a lot of um, telehealth psychiatry yeah. and paediatrics, yeah. and I think you can still get the, the script dispensed in the ACT. I think um, um, if I might add to that, Leonie, um, yep. You want to make sure, Tracy, that the approval is in the jurisdiction where the patient will collect the medication. So, yes, we have lots of Sydney or telehealth in Queensland um, prescribers, uh, but the patient requires an approval here in the ACT. Um, and so as long as they've got that, it works okay. It goes both ways too. We do have specialists here in the ACT who are supporting patients who may live in Queanbeyan and the like. Um, and Leonie, if you could just note that I moved one of the Q and A questions into answered, but it didn't actually answer the question. Um, if you could, make oh, okay, sure I will that read. Yeah, I'll read that one out. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, and can I just say, is Smart Forms and Canberra Script? So, best practice has Smart Forms, which is how we've been doing our CHO approvals, um, and that's kind of embedded in the software, so you don't need to enter patient details, and it saves onto the patient file. Um, with the Canberra Script approvals, do we need to um, get the approval and then print it out, and then get scanned into the patient files? It would be so kind of easier for us if that was not yes. the case because that's a bit kind of double handily. Yeah. I think the um, health link uh, interface is so yeah. fabulous. I think the team before me, I think um, Vivian's probably listening, but I think they did too good a job with that interface form and it is fabulous for prescribers to be able to pull it in from your software. Specialists don't tend to use it as much. So that's it seems to be easier for specialists just to use the camera script platform. But in our most recent update to Canberra Script, which just was rolled out last month, once you've done your first application in Canberra Script, you'll now be able to go in there and just click reapply. One button, done. So right. as you start to utilise it, it will become easier moving forward. But we are also talking to um, HealthLink and other providers about whether we can utilise a similar interface. Uh, that's a work in progress. Um, that would yes. be really good. Yes, it's okay. a much quicker system um, from a prescriber run. point of view uh, yeah. for GPs particularly, but it's yeah. a much slower system into the team here. So they have their sort of pros and cons. So, um, yeah, but as you've used it um, for patients, it'll start to become easier to repopulate quicker even than through your prescribing software. Okay, thanks. Um, so... Can you tell us about other over-the-counter products that might be helpful? So we've talked a bit about fish oil, one gram of EPA. Um, and uh, so the effect size, that'd be interesting if you know the um, effect size, Joe, when you were um, talking about the stimulants, you had the 1.8. Um, so, and I think intuitive was 1.4, but um, that would be interesting one, to hear that. One, Under yeah, I understand there's very little evidence, though, that people are already dabbling and interested and I'd love to be able to advise is the rest of the question. I think there's some evolving evidence for ginseng. Um, but the, 
for those who listen to the Attitude podcasts, um, just over the last couple of weeks, they had a nutritionist come on and talk about all of the promising over-the-counter supplements. Um, and it's really easy to access those podcasts. I think the effect size, look, I don't think, to be fair, the effect size for fish oil has been clarified. Um, it's probably about an eighth as effective as some um, stimulants. Um, so modest, much less than the second and third line, um, mm. but still without side effects. And mm. um, I also think there's a message that fish oil probably helps, you know, most people's neural networks. Um, so it means that, you know, families can take fish oil to support their brain function and some people in the family take additional for additional medications as well. Yeah. What about melatonin? Well, melatonin um, obviously helps with sleep onset and there's some evidence around migraine prevention in children, but... Um, Unless ADHD symptoms are related to sleep, I don't know that it's um, uh, specifically useful for ADHD symptoms. Yeah, yeah. They have said they have got a melatonin on the, I'm um, not sure if it's on the PBS, but it's approved for ASD. So if there's, slim, I guess, COVID, yeah, yeah, right. that, that yeah. really expensive. It's, it's yes. not. Well, it's not on the PBS, so it yes, just ends up costing uh, quite a lot of money. Yeah. But it's for sleep disorders in ASD, not for um, ASD symptoms. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, we have another medication question, and it's if estrogen decreases, can if estrogen decreases, so it can exacerbate symptoms in young women, and HRT is being explored in menopausal women, um, should the combined pill be considered for young women? also to help with an increase in unwanted pregnancies. <laughs> um, treating your ADHD. Look, I think that that's where the limit of the evidence is at the moment. It's such a new area of research. There's a couple of researchers in the United States who are really focused. Um, and my understanding of the evidence that exists is they think HRT might be effective in perimenopausal women for ADHD symptoms, but they have not looked at the combined pill um, for menstrual fluctuations. They're just kind of observing the phenomena. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I think Carla's typing the answer to the last one, um, which is the um, reason oh, we've got um, the podcast that you mentioned, Joe. So I think Carla's answered that one. So I think we'll, we might wind it up now. I think we've worked our way through the questions. Um, I just want to say thank you very much, all of you. That was such a great webinar. And um, we've all got, you know, so many patients with ADHD and friends with ADHD. So um, normalizing it and talking about its kind of positives and how to manage the challenges that people have is really useful for everybody. Um, we're going to put the uh, recording up on our YouTube page and we'll be sending out the slides next week and also um, the other resources that people have requested. Um, please fill in your evaluation survey so that we know what other topics you'd like CHN to cover in their educational programs. And um, uh, thank you very much to the presenters again and good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Danny. Bye-bye.